Stories. From a parent reading a bedtime story to a toddler, to the epic films that entertain us, stories touch our imagination. Stories pull at our heartstrings. Stories can lift us up. And stories can frighten us. What is it about story that is so special? Simply put, God speaks to us through stories, and God can speak to others through our stories. Think of God's word. In the beginning, and Genesis tells us the story of how God created us. Think of the stories of the Old Testament, Noah's Ark, the parting of the Red Sea, Jonah and the whale, David and Goliath. And then consider the greatest story ever told of God coming to us as an infant child and Jesus teaching us by telling us stories, parables whose deep meanings move our hearts. Remember the story of the prodigal son or the story of the good Samaritan. And remember the story of Jesus' passion his agony in the garden, suffering and dying on the cross for us, meeting Mary Magdalene in the garden after the resurrection, and then walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, where they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. The center of our Catholic faith is retelling that story at every Mass, where once again we recognize him in the breaking of the bread. In this Spark series, we're going to focus on story, but not just any story. We're going to focus on your story. What is the story of what God has done in your life and how you can share that story with others? Welcome to our Spark series. This time, as you saw in the intro, we're going to be talking about story and about how our stories can be shared with others. One of the things that um, we have found is that Catholics often don't know how to share their stories very well. So if somebody says, why are you Catholic? Or what is your story? Or um, what has God done for you? Sometimes it's hard for us to be able to on the fly articulate that. And this series is about really delving into our stories, finding out what they are, discovering what God has done for us, and then learning about how to share that story with others. And so the format of our videos is going to be like this. First, we're going to share with you a story from the Bible, something that happened in the Bible, someone telling their story perhaps, or a story that was given in the Bible that then we will use as a launch pad for the subject of the day. Today's story and today's um, subject is the call stories. When has God called me? Or when has God called me to conversion? And then we'll have a sharing of the, a story from one of our um, staff members or parish members who will tell their story uh, along that particular subject line. And then as we go on, we will pause the video and give you time to reflect. And each of you will have a notebook that you will be able to use where you'll be able to write notes about what it is that God has done in your life as it relates to the story of that day. And then after you've spent some time recording those notes down, you'll then talk about your stories together in your Spark group. Then later, as we get to the end of this series, we'll come together for a kind of working session where we will learn how to put our stories together and come up with something that we can then be able to share with others so that we can share the story of Jesus just as so many people in the Bible did and just as those stories were shared before us. So let's get started with today. Today we're going to feature, as I said, when has God called me or when have I been called to conversion? And I can't think of a better case to illustrate this than the story of St. Paul. St. Paul, of course, was known as Saul before his conversion, and he was one who was not a really likely guy to be converted. He was one who went around persecuting the members of the way, 
which is what the Christians first called themselves. He went around persecuting the members of the way, and he was quite reviled and uh, feared by many in the Christian community. So you can only imagine what it was like when this guy came and said that he had been converted. But lest I tell the rest of the story, let me give you the story in Paul's own words as it comes from the Bible in Acts 22. Paul said, I am a Jew born at Tarsus in Cilicia, but bought, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as you all are in this day. I persecuted this way, that is the Christians, to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brethren, and I journeyed to Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I made my journey and drew near to Damascus, about noon, a great light from heaven shone, suddenly shone about me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And when I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the, blind, by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And in that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the just one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you do and see and what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So that was Paul's own testimony of his conversion. But it wasn't just his conversion, it was also his call. Because you see, God decided that this man Saul, who was persecuting, would be the one to actually spread the witness to all of the Mediterranean re region. Paul was the greatest evangelist by far of the earliest Christian church, and God chose him. We might ask, well, why did God choose him? Why did God choose Paul? Well, first of all, Paul was very articulate, well-spoken, well-educated. He was one who really knew how to speak and to be able to tell his story. And also, he certainly had an amazing story to tell, going from one who was persecuting to one who was spreading the gospel. He also spoke Greek so that he could speak to all the peoples around the region who had been colonized by the Greeks. And he was a Roman citizen, which meant he could pass freely. So Paul had all the ingredients he needed. All he needed to be able to do that was Jesus. And that's what he received on the road to Damascus, where Jesus called him and brought him forward and cleaned his heart and turned him to the gospel. And from there, Paul became the greatest evangelist in the church. So that was a story of call and conversion at the same time. And so now let me share my call and conversion story. My conversion came first. When I was growing up as a kid, I grew up in the Baptist church. I wasn't a Catholic. And in fact, at age 11, I became what Baptists called being saved. I accepted the Lord into my life. And for many years, we, I was, went through the church and um, followed Jesus and went to church. And I was baptized later and and all of those things that uh, you would do to follow the Lord, and, and I was very fervent in it. And then when I got to, right before I went to college, my parents divorced, and kind of, 
it was a difficult situation because I kind of was left kind of wondering about where God was in my life. And then I went to college and it didn't get any better um, because I really wondered where God was in my life, even to the point where I stopped praying and I stopped going to church and I stopped reading the Bible and I just kind of fell away. During that time, I met Aaron, uh, a Catholic. And at the time that we got married, I still wasn't doing any of those things, wasn't going to church. But a few years later, some things happened in my life that really made me need to seek out God. I remember a time that my cousin had fell ill to cancer. And I was on the phone with my grandmother, who I was very close to. And I said, Grandma, how do you handle this? How do you deal with this? And she just said, we just pray. You know, Grandma was sharing her witness with me, her witness of how she had the Lord in her life. And I heard it, and it struck me, but it didn't move me to do anything. It was probably about uh, half a year, nine months later, perhaps, that um, my Aaron and I um, lost a pregnancy to a miscarriage. And at that point, I was really distraught. I was really wondering what could console me. I was so upset at the thought of losing a baby and losing this new life and really wondering, you know, what's going to happen, Lord? Are we going to be able to have kids? And actually, that was what was happening. I said, what's going to happen, Lord? I found myself praying. I found myself turning to God. Because in my, at that point, darkest hour, I realized that I needed the Lord in my life, that I couldn't handle this all on my own. And so we started finding a Catholic church to go to, and pretty soon I was in RCIA, and pretty soon I became Catholic, and I just kept growing in faith and growing in faith and growing in faith. So mine wasn't an instantaneous conversion like Paul's on the road to Damascus, but it certainly was a story of where I found that God could give me what I could not get for myself, which was peace of mind and confidence that God was always with me. Then later, I started feeling the call to become a deacon. And I started thinking about it, thinking maybe I could do that. And then certain people in the parish started saying, hey, do you ever think maybe you could, you should be a deacon? And I thought, okay, well, yeah, I get it. And then Deacon Dave Sharp said, hey, I really think you might have a call. And I was like, okay, fine. And then there was a Sunday that, um, that Deacon Dave Sharp preached about the diaconate, about the vocation. And on the way home, my then 13-year-old oldest son said to me, Dad, you know, what Deacon Dave said, I think you could be a deacon. And I was like, okay, if parishioners and Deacon Dave and now my own 13-year-old son who lives with me and knows me thinks that I could do this, maybe it's time to make the call. And so I did. And the rest is history. That's my call story. It's a story that I tell with great relish because it's a story of how God worked in my life. I didn't expect that God was going to do the things in my life that he did. I didn't expect that I'd be sitting here talking to you right now making this video. I had no expectation of that whatsoever. But somehow God intervened. And he did something different in my life. And it's made my life so much richer and so much more wonderful than it would have been otherwise. So earlier, Devin shared with you his call to conversion. And I wanted to share um, today a short um, version of my call to service. So when Devin was discerning whether he should be a deacon and become a deacon, and that was a very long process, years of classes, and really um, a lot of insight into himself and, and what God was calling him to. But it wasn't just his journey. I also had to discern um, my own call as a deacon's wife. Father Dave always used to talk about that growing a deacon was a BOGO, a buy one, get one free. That you got the deacon, but you also got the deacon wife. And uh, that always, I thought that was really funny, but it sort of put a little pressure on me as sort of what, what is my role supposed to be? What am I called to? What am I supposed to do and be here as a deacon? At the time that Devin was um, taking all of his classes, we already had three deacons here at Mary Magdalene, which also meant that we had three deacon wives. We had Judy Scharf and Linda Chevalier and Yvonne Price. 
And so trying to discover what was my call as a deacon wife. You know, was I called to be Judy Scharf, who was involved in Befrienders and, and was very, very visible in the parish? Was I called to be Linda? And was I called to be a spiritual director and very involved in prayer? Was I called to be Yvonne, a quilter and someone who worked a lot behind the scenes? You know, what was I being called to? And I spent a lot of time in prayer listening to, to where God wanted me to be. And finally, I heard the answer, and it was that I just needed to be the best Aaron I could be. I wasn't supposed to be Judy. I wasn't supposed to be Linda. I wasn't supposed to be Yvonne. I was supposed to be Aaron. And just to keep doing what I was doing and to remain open, just keep listening. And, and he would lead me, and he would tell me what I needed to do. And I could not have ever foreseen all of the things I have done here in the parish as a deacon wife. And if you'd told me, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> but this journey of um, discovery and being able to serve has just been so incredibly rewarding. And I can't even begin to express how blessed I feel and how grateful I am to be open to God and to just all of the opportunities he's given me here to serve.